two men in the 1940s made a confession of faith, and they soon started spreading the gospel in their towns. A few years later, they met and started a ministry. They so impacted the hearts of America that they helped organize the very first integrated public meeting in the South. They became very close friends and were roommates as they traveled the globe to Europe, Africa, preaching the gospel. Many people thought that one of these eloquent, powerful preachers would be the front runner in transforming the world for Christ. However, after proclaiming Christ to hundreds of thousands of people, that same potential front runner started to experience marital issues, doubt overtook him, and he eventually walked away from the faith. He embraced atheism and even wrote a book called Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. His close friend continued to serve the Lord faithfully, and to this day he's a pillar of the faith. The man walking with the Lord is none other than evangelist Billy Graham. What happened when these two men heard the gospel? The other man, his name was Charles Templeton, who exchanged the truth for a lie. What happens when the word of God is sown in the human heart? Today I want to establish that the gospel will be rejected by most who hear it. And I intend to share three reasons why the gospel will be rejected by the masses. So let's open up the scriptures to Mark 4 and read what he recorded as the first of Jesus' numerous parables. I'll give you a moment to turn to it, click to it, swipe to it. Again, that's Mark chapter 4. And I'm going to start out by just reading 3 through 9. Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up. It increased and produced some 30, some 60, and some 100-fold. So what is a parable? Well, parable comes from, the word parable comes from two Greek words that mean to throw alongside. In this case, it's throwing an earthly truth beside a spiritual truth. Now, Jesus used some 38 recorded parables in the Gospels. But telling parables was not a new phenomenon in the Bible. In fact, one of the most well-known parables was in the Old Testament. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, you don't have to turn to it, but if you're a student of the Bible, you may remember that the prophet Nathan told David a parable that let him know God is aware of your adultery with Bathsheba. And he knows that you put a hit out on her husband, Uriah. Now, God used this parable to expose sin and bring about repentance in David. But we'll see that repentance wasn't the reason of his use of parables to the nation of Israel. So let's read on in Mark chapter 4, verse 10. But when he was alone, those around him with the twelve... He's talking about his true followers now. With the twelve asked him about the parable, and he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. There's a lot of uncertainty about what the kingdom of God is, but the kingdom is a time from when Jesus started his ministry until the end of the age when the Lord returns to take us home. He continued, but to those who are outside, outside meaning non-believers, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Now, these forceful words of Jesus need to be understood in the context of the nation of Israel, rejecting him and the leaders despising him. They knew he was doing miracles that can only be done by a higher power, but they weren't going to attribute them to God. So they said he cast out demons by the power of Satan. And that was the last straw. Jesus had had enough. 
No prophet in the Old Testament was ever accused of such demonic activity. Therefore, he spoke to them in parables as an act of judgment against them. They would hear what he says and see the picture he paints in the natural realm, but the supernatural meaning would fly right over their heads. Now let's continue reading on at verse 13. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? He was calling them to listen and to draw close because this is, this is so important. And this brings me to the first reason why Jesus said the gospel is rejected. Because Satan steals the truth. Verse 15 says, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. How does this happen, you might ask? Well, it begins with a heart of continual unbelief and exchanging the truth. Now, you've seen these people. You've talked to them. You tell them something spiritual. It just goes in one ear and right out the other because they're truly hostile to God is the problem. An example of that was Herod and Antipas and John the Baptist. John the Baptist told Herod that it is unlawful for you to take your brother's wife. And he was so hostile to God that he later would have John the Baptist beheaded because he didn't like him speaking the truth. The truth that he tried to give him just went in one ear and out the other. Some of you that are more along my generation might remember a group called Bone Thugs and Harmony. <laughs> they were one of the biggest music groups of the mid-90s. They're not as big now, but they sold over 25 million records to date. And I, too, bought their albums when I belonged to the world, and Satan had blinded me, them, and millions of their followers with songs like Mr. Ouija, Bud Smokers Only, and Mo Murder. Filling your mind with such music is always going to lead to a heart of indifference to spiritual things to where you can't hear from the word of God. Or like the person that accepts the Big Bang and rejects in the beginning God, the person that thinks that everything is explained through natural processes and that we all came from slime and ooze instead of coming from the earth, from the dirt, as, as God told us. Like Romans 122, claiming to be wise and to be intellectual and have degrees and proofs, claiming to be wise, they become fools believing that nothing created everything. When spiritual things are given to a reprobate mind, which is a mind without God, one that God has rejected as wicked and evil, the word of God is quickly taken away by Satan. The second reason the gospel is rejected is because of a, a religious experience is mistaken for an encounter with the living God. Let's read on in verse 16. Likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now, this is the person that makes a shallow profession of faith. Now, the Bible speaks of false prophets, speaks of false teachers. So don't be surprised to know, don't be surprised to know that there are false converts among us. If you say you're a Christian, but you don't know what you believe and why you believe it, unfortunately, your sins are not forgiven. And how can I say that, you probably think or ask. If you look up at verse 12, Jesus said that you must first perceive, because he said they do not perceive, they see, but they don't perceive. That's the what you believe. Then you must understand its significance. This is the why you believe it. And these two things should lead you to repentance. But too often we leave churches and conferences on cloud nine until temptation or a crisis unravels and we go back to the filthy mud of sin just like a pig. Winston Churchill famously said that dogs look up to man, cats look down to man, 
but pigs look us straight in the eye and see an equal. Now, pig is an interesting animal. Uh, you know, most people think that they're dirty and, you know, you don't want to touch them, don't want to get near them. Well, pigs, they don't have sweat glands. And so whenever they get hot, the only thing they can do is go and cool off in some water. And mud is actually better because it won't evaporate as quickly as water, so they go and wallow in the mud. Well, it's the same thing with the unbeliever. You know, his flesh gets hot. He's, he's thinking that he's walking with the Lord, but after a while, he's got to cool his flesh off and go back to whatever it was that he did because he hasn't really repented and put his trust in Christ. Now, the third and final reason Jesus said that we reject the gospel of grace is because we love the world and the things in it. Let's pick it up at verse 18 where it says, Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this word of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Now, is Jesus saying that we can't be concerned with anything other than the Bible? I mean, are we to tell our boss, listen, I need you to cut my salary in half. I'm, I'm a little worried that this check might deceive me. I certainly hope you're not doing that. <laughs> um, no, the problem is when these things overpower your heart and they choke the word. Uh, you know, a few, what was it, two weeks ago, I guess, the East Coast experienced the worst snowstorm in, in history, I believe. Um, over 30-something inches, uh, 42, 43 people dead, last time I saw on the news. And uh, one of the stories that I remember was that uh, a, a girl and her baby were in a car. And uh, the snow was up, you know, above the bumper in the back. And I don't know what it was in the front, but the snow was covering her vehicle so much that she started the car up to warm the car up with her and the baby in. And because the snow was above the pipes in the car, they just suffocated and perished. And they found them later, and they were both dead. The car's still running. And that's, that's really the picture of what happens when we allow the world to creep into our heart, and we, we, we just seek to do things that are pleasing to our flesh, and we seek to do things that make us feel good without any care of what God says about it. Uh, if, if you read in Luke 21, 34, real quick, he talks about it there as well. In Luke 21, 34, it says, But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and that day will come upon you unexpectedly talks about your heart being weighed down with carousing. What is he talking about? He's, he's talking about those that in their time of what they want to do, they just ride around looking for anything to get into. I can remember when I was in the world, I would, me and my, me and my friends would just jump in the car, and we really didn't have a destination. We were just riding around looking to do whatever we could to get into some trouble. Um, you know, it's like a song that I heard. Uh, you really can't see too clearly through weed smoke. And when the Lord is trying to speak to you, you're not going to hear it if you, you're just driving around, you're carousing, you're, you're getting you know, into the things of the world where it leaves you drunk and, and high. And, and the, the end is always going to be destruction. You know, Jesus said to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, for in it you'll have eternal life. But instead... We eat of every delectable passing that feeds the flesh and doing things that just obey the lust of your hearts. In conclusion, when the seed fell onto these three soils, they were already inadequate for the seed to grow. I used to think that when the, when the sower was throwing seeds that the, the soil was good, but later on the thorns crept in, or later on the soil got bad. No, if you go back and read, 
when the seeds were thrown down, the soil was already inadequate. It was already corrupt. There's a phrase that's often said, God knows my heart. Listen, whatever, man, God knows my heart. Well, you're right. God talks about how your heart is in Jeremiah 17, 9. He says that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can know it? To add a few words to Mark Cameron's book, Bible Doctrines, he said, there is a warning that there may be a refusal without reflection, a profession without a possessing, and head knowledge without a heart trust. Therefore, we must ask the Father to give us good soil, to give us a new heart, as he promised in Ezekiel 26, 36, because when the word of God is given and you are an unbeliever, it's not going to fall on good soil. You cannot expect good fruit to come. Jesus also said that anyone that does not produce good fruit, he was using a parable, he said that anything that does not produce fruit is going to be thrown into the fire to be burned. Now he's talking about He's talking about vegetation, but at the same time, he's talking about those that don't show any fruit. They're going to be sent to eternal damnation. So therefore, again, we must ask the Father to give us a new heart, to give us good soil, so that our desires might be changed, and that the seed might take root, so that we can be like those that Jesus said, who hear the word, accept the word, and bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100.